Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Solish. And my name is Iman Chaudhry, and you're listening to the seventh episode of Seeing Clearly, a pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. On today's episode, we will be interviewing Dr. Zia. Dr. Zia is an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the University of Ottawa Eye Institute. She completed her residency training in ophthalmology at the University of Ottawa Eye Institute, followed by a two-year fellowship training in cornea, external disease, interior segment, and refractive surgery. Her practice encompasses tertiary care clinical and surgical ophthalmology, with a focus specifically on ocular surface disease, corneal transplantation, ocular tumor resection, interior segment reconstruction, and complex cataract surgery. Dr. Ziai is also heavily involved in clinical research, as well as resident and fellow surgical and clinical training. She is the director of the Cornea, Anterior Segment, and Refractive Surgery Fellowship Program, as well as the director of Ophthalmic Medical Technology Training Program at the University of Ottawa Eye Institute. She is also a founding member of the Canadian Women in Medicine and a member of the Canadian Ophthalmologic Society Board of Directors. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Z.I. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. So um, I guess we'll just jump straight into the questions. So the first question that uh, we have for you is what drew you to the field of ophthalmology? Well, actually, I was pretty late in my interest in ophthalmology. I was probably in third year of medical school when I discovered ophthalmology. I knew all along that I wanted to do a surgical specialty, but I didn't quite know which one. And I was certainly interested in being involved in a field that allowed me some flexibility and sort of, you know, a nice, a nice lifestyle and a good schedule because I know I wanted to have a family. And then I met ophthalmology through one of my mentors, Dr. Bruce Jackson. He was chairman in our department at that time, and I was on the student council in med school. So I met him through some dean's retreat, and the rest is history. Then I did my rotation, and got, I realized that that's exactly what I wanted to do because it was such a beautiful specialty with wonderful outcomes and the opportunity to do really fine surgery, and, um, and that was it. So I just did some electives and applied, and and got in and it's been a really great experience. Oh, that, that's super nice and exciting to hear. I feel like a lot of our guests kind of somewhat accidentally stumbled upon ophthalmology and then really found that they were very passionate about it, which is also nice, especially for some of our viewers and listeners who um, don't necessarily know what they're going to do yet and they're entering clerkship right now. So thank you. Um, and then our second question for you is, could you talk a little bit about what a day in the life of a cornea specialist looks like? Yeah, well, I can tell you what a day in my life looks like because um, I'm in a very specific type of practice. I work in an academic center, so I'm full time at the hospital. So it's a little bit different than what you would find um, in the community, even as a specialist. So um, I, what I enjoy most about my work is that I am always surrounded by learners. So that's a huge part of my, my days. I have residents around me all the time. We have fellows, we have research fellows. Um, so I'm always teaching, um, not often didactic teaching, actually, but clinical teaching and lots of surgical teaching. So um, I'll tell you about a week in my life as opposed to a day in my life. So I will operate um, a full day of intraocular surgery per week, and I spend at least half a day doing anterior, uh, sorry, ocular surface minor procedures. Um, I also do refractive laser on patients who are getting laser eye surgery. And then I spend some time in clinic, uh, about a day and a half per week. And um, in, in my spare time, I um, work on other projects like the Canadian Women in Medicine and, and whatnot. Wow, oh, I mean, thanks for sharing that. It's cool to see that you have so much going on throughout the week. I feel like I would never get bored <laughs> uh, if I was in your position which is um, true. amazing to see that you get uh, to have that lifestyle, especially being in an academic center. I feel like people don't realize how diverse it can be. Um, and it's great for our listeners because most of us are going through med school and rotating through um, our electives in an academic center. So it's nice to get a glimpse into, into what we could see. So thank you for that. Um, Speaking of uh, learners, we have a lot of uh, student listeners who are interested in surgical specialties. 
So from your experience working with learners, do you mind providing any advice on what makes a good learner and how students can stand out in their surgical rotations? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think when you're a student, I remember being at your stage actually, and you know, um, your, your mind just gets bogged down with, um, you know, knowing as much as possible and doing as much as possible and getting to know as many people as possible. And all of that can be pretty stressful, but I think really now on the other side of it and involved in, you know, CARMS interviews and accepting people into the program and then fellowship interviews at multiple levels, you know, bringing people into our program. I think I now know for sure and with confidence, and I wish I knew this when I was in third year, um, is that the most important thing is that you're just a likable person and that you're a team player and you're a hard worker. Um, we siphon through a lot of um, students coming through and a lot of applications and, you know, the ones that always stand out the most and the ones that everyone wants are the people who we feel can be part of the team because you can learn everything you need to learn to be an ophthalmologist in those few years that you're a resident, but you certainly can't learn the EQ um, that's needed necessarily to be part of the team. Um, and in fact, I, when I got into ophthalmology, I was probably one of the least clinically knowledgeable of the applicants because I had decided so late, it was at the end of my third year. So I didn't even know how to do a proper slit lamp exam, or I definitely did not use how to know how to use an indirect ophthalmoscope, but um, it didn't matter because if you can get along with the people, they can teach you. <laughs> so just be a team player, you know, be, be, um, be willing to learn, be humble, be a hard worker, be friendly, be yourself. You know, you don't need to show us what you're capable of doing. Um, you don't need to tell us, you can just show um, what a, what a, you know, what a good member of the team that you can be. Oh, and I, I think that's a great point, especially because I find um, just like as a medical student, it's, there's a lot of pressure to do, you know, research and get very involved mm -hmm. and like learn all that you can know. And, and in reality, that's clearly impossible to know everything, especially because we're only students, we're here to learn. So at the end of the day, it's truly important to, you know, be there to have like an open mind to interact with the people around you and just set a positive tone and positive expressions to show that you really are a team player. So thank you for that advice. Um, I'm going to shift gears a tiny bit away from that and just ask a little bit more about you and something that you do specifically. So we know that you're the co-founder and the past president of the national organization, Canadian Women in Medicine. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what that is, how you became involved with that, and just like let our viewers know a little bit more about it. Yeah, I mean, it, this is something that's grown a lot in the past few years. It was really just an idea I had back in 20. 16. Um, I think that that was the year in December where um, Dr. Elena Frick was murdered by her husband in Toronto. And I was at a leadership event um, for young ophthalmologists. And I had an idea because morale was really low at the time. And um, women physicians in particular, many of us knew her and um, were feeling really not great. And so I thought it would be really good if we could just get together. And um, so I, you know, I talked to a few friends and I talked to my husband and I said, you know, you think people would come if I kind of organized a get together and, and uh, they were all like, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe they would come. And so I posted about it on our really big, we have a private social media group. There's about 6,000 women doctors from across Canada. I posted about it. And then I woke up the next morning and there were like 300 <laughs> comments and I was like, okay, well maybe I'll try to organize this thing. Anyway, so our first conference ended up being in 2018. I recruited some women to help me um, organize it. And now it's just grown and grown. We sold out the first event um, and then we moved to Toronto for a bigger venue and we sold out the second event. Then we decided to build this national organization, which is a not-for-profit um, to represent um, women physicians. And so now there's one arm that's the organization um, that does a lot of advocacy and whatnot. And then the other, um, the other arm is the events side. So that's the conference. And now we have a longitudinal leadership course 
that's running its second one. It's almost sold out actually. So um, it's a longitudinal leadership course for women doctors and most of them are Canadian. Um, it's, a, it's a three month course and we have expert speakers and you know, it's leadership, not just for work but it's like leadership in your life. And so we designed the course and we recruited the speakers and we, um, you know, we really targeted women physicians. And I think that's why it's been so popular. It's about to sell out the, for the second time. So it's been a really fun side project. It's very fulfilling um, because I think we really do touch women physicians lives in a very particular way that did not exist before. And we offer sort of, you know, a little, a little getaway um, from, their crazy busy lives. Most are mothers and caregivers and partners and um, physicians, obviously. So it's really nice for them all to have a weekend every year in June where they can run away and get together and support each other and not think about any of those other things they need to do in their lives. It sounds amazing and a mm -hmm. lot of fun, to be honest. Yeah. Um, congratulations on all of the success you've had with it. I'm sure Canadian women and really appreciate the opportunity to be able to have something like that. It must be really nice to get together with a group of like-minded individuals and just relax and, um, and learn, um, learn from everything that, uh, that you guys are promoting. So I think that that sounds great. I guess, I mean, very relevant to the, the group of, of women that you're with, uh, but more specifically to yourself. Um, there's a lot of challenges that come with being a female in medicine in general, but do you mind maybe talking a little bit about how you navigated the challenges that come with being a female in ophthalmology specifically? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a lot harder when I started. Actually, when I started my residency at the University of Ottawa Eye Institute, I was the only um, woman resident. And so um, I remember we had um, one of our teachers, Dr. Clark, he's passed away since, but he used to come to teaching with like a, a pile of folders with notes. This is before everyone had all their um, screens in front of them. And so he would give all the blue folders to all the boys. And he always had like a, a pink folder for me um, with all of my pediatric ophthalmology notes. So um, it was, it was very different. I was lucky because I had a few mentors, male mentors who um, were really incredible and supportive. And I never really felt like I was at all at a disadvantage. I think that it does not speak to the reality of everybody, to be honest, but um, I was really well surrounded by wonderful male mentors. I didn't have any female mentors at the time. Um, it's very different now. Ophthalmology, women, the women, women's presence in ophthalmology has grown exponentially. Um, I was also the first woman resident to uh, be pregnant in our program. Mm -hmm. And I had, I was told not to have a baby by people who were outside of the program. They said, it's not a good idea to get pregnant when you're a resident, a surgical resident. And so I, of course I got pregnant because I wanted lots of children and it was time to start and it was fine. You know, it went okay. I think if you um, are lucky enough to be surrounded by supportive people and a good department and a great program, um, then um, you can, you can do it. You can do what you, what you want to do, but you have to make sure you have that safety net of people around you who will who will help you. I do, I do think there are issues um, that are overarching about being a woman, especially in surgical fields, but truly in all fields in medicine and gender pay gap is huge, mm -hmm. a huge hot topic right now. This is something we really need to get to the bottom of. It's a really difficult topic to enlighten people on because even when you show people the research, there, um, there's a lot of resistance um, against believing that there's a true gender pay gap when even when you factor in all of the variables. And so, um, you know, so we're slowly, I think, nipping away at these things, but, um, you know, it's going to take a long time. And events like the Canadian Women in Medicine Conference, and then there's some events similar in the US, and they're really bringing to light not only bringing to light these topics, but also empowering women to speak up about them and to make changes. Um, research is so important because if you don't have data, then you can't make change. And I think there's more and more people doing research and publishing on these things. So, um, you know, I think that it's a shifting um, environment and all of us women in medicine, um, it doesn't matter the field. Um, we, we have to be aware of, 
what, you know, what the issue, the main issues are. And, you know, sometimes it's microaggressions that we're fighting on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes it's macroaggressions, but if we have organizations and friends who can support us through them, then maybe we can make change a little bit faster than what's been happening the past 50 years. Yeah, no, I, well, first of all, thank you for sharing all of that and being so transparent, but I, I think you bring up a very important point, which is that it's very, it can be very easy for an individual to notice something difficult for them or to be going through something, but then mm -hmm. to like have a group of supportive people, whether that be a mentor or just like you talked about with the Canadian woman in medicine that you can share with that, like, hopefully they're feeling the exact same way. And maybe you didn't even know. And that helps to, to really promote change, especially in the field where change is always extremely important and very prevalent. So thank you for sharing all of that. And thank you for answering all those incredible questions for us today. I know that they've um, been amazing for both Iman and I to listen to, and especially our viewers will feel the same. Um, before we end off, we like to finish with a little would you rather segment, which is just to end on a light note, get to know you a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask the first question, which is, would you rather be able to never go out during the day or never go out during the night? I would rather never go out during the night. I think that's what happens when you get older, maybe. <laughs> you guys may answer differently. Yeah, it's just like, I could just, I could put the fireplace on and put a movie and I would be okay. But to miss being outdoors in the daytime and seeing nature, I think would be horrible. So no, I'm, I think I'm on <laughs> the same way. Yeah, um, I think I'm on the same page as well. Surprisingly, maybe to you guys. <laughs> Um, okay, so our next question, um, would you rather be completely alone for five years or constantly be surrounded by people and never be alone for five years? Oh, that's a good one. You know, I'm very tempted to pick option number one because my life is just a complete circus. Um, I have four children and a very busy household and a puppy and this crazy busy but lovely career and and see whim. So sometimes the thought of being alone is kind of like, you know, uh, surreal, but um, I think that would make me go crazy. So I will up pick option B and be surrounded by people, whether it's people I know or people I don't know. I always enjoy getting to know new people. And I think there's something to learn from everybody from all walks of life. So I'll pick option B for sure. But then on that first day after the five years, then I just want to shut the door <laughs> maybe for a few hours. That's very fair. And I think we all got a little bit of a glimpse of not being alone, but uh, but spending some time by ourselves throughout COVID. So I think I'd have to agree with you about, uh, about that answer. How about you, Danielle? Yeah, no, I'm definitely the same way. I think we're also, all of us are either in a career or going into a career where it's a lot of interaction with other people. So I, I really can't imagine being alone for that long. Maybe like the one or two days I would crave, but five years, I don't think I could it's do. Too long. Yeah. Too long, 100%. Um, on that note, I just want to thank you so, so much for coming and joining us today. This was an incredibly excellent episode. It was so great to meet you and get to know you. And I want to thank all of our listeners for listening to Seeing Clearly. So just a reminder that this is our pre-clerkship guide to all things ophthalmology. So if anyone wants to stay caught up with what iCurriculum has to offer, you can check out our website, which is www icurriculum.com and you can follow us on Instagram at icurriculum. Thanks for listening everyone and thank you again for being here with us. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.